System stuff, final project proposal. Get us started. Okay. Um, so, the topic for today is the following. We're going along, writing stuff to the uh, to the disk using the file system. Everything is fine, uh, and then a squirrel chews on the power. Cord and right in the middle of our file system operation system loses power. Um, uh, we uh, uh, capture the squirrel, um, put it somewhere else, and put in a new power cord, reboot. Uh, is our file system okay or not? So, unfortunately, this crash may have occurred in the middle of some multi-step operation. Uh, and so, <clears throat> is this dark blue legible? No, I, I didn't think so. Uh, dark blue chalk, you're fired. Get out of here. No wonder it no one's used it. Um, <laughs> okay, on reboot after crash, um, we have a bad situation where maybe we try and boot up and we crash again due to some inconsistency with the, the file system. I actually think that there is a worse outcome than uh, our file system is corrupted and, and we crash. Anyone have a suggestion for what might be worse? Well, uh, the user thinks everything can be successfully, but there's some hidden problem. Exactly. There's no sign that things are terribly wrong. There's no crash. But then when we read or write data on the file system, that's wrong because there's some part of the file system that is inconsistent and is going to cause these hidden problems down the line. So this we really, really want to avoid. Because this is sort of weird, bad things are happening, and we just can't tell that that's the case. All right, so let's put this in terms of a concrete example. So we're going to consider a very small file system. And this file system is going to have Some bitmaps. It's going to have inodes, and it's going to have data. And uh, we just have eight inodes and eight data blocks. And uh, we're going to say each of our, uh, have the, the size of, of data blocks here is not, not important. They could be, could be four kilobytes, something like that. Uh, and then our bitmaps, we're actually going to have two of them. Why would we need two 
different bin maps to keep track of things that are allocated or free. In this case, we have two kinds of things that could be allocated. We want to keep track of which, which inodes are free and allocated and which data blocks are free and allocated. So we'll have a separate bitmap for each of those. So one for inodes, one for data. And each of these will just have a single bit for each of the eight slots. So one, two, Anyway, so these are divided up into single single bits, and currently we just have I have our one inode. We have one file in this file system has an inode, and it has a data block, and so kind of our inode bitmap says inode two is allocated. Our data bitmap says data block index 4 is allocated. This is the state of our system. Does this make sense? Any questions on this picture? All right, so here is what we want to do. We want to append a new block's worth of data to our file. And we have kind of a new four kilobytes or whatever it is worth of data. We want to stick it on to the end of this file. So uh, an important question here is what in this picture needs to change? Like which parts of our file system need to be updated and in what way in order to append a new block's worth of data to our file? So please discuss with your with your neighbors what needs to change. And in particular, we're trying to think of what writes to the disk will we need to do. How many kind of separate places need to be updated or changed in order to affect this, this operation. So take a few minutes and discuss that with your neighbors. All right. So What's something that needs to change to append our new block data? The data concerning the inodes needs to be shifted down. Um, can you say more what you mean by shifted down? We're assuming that bitmaps have to be close to each other so that they're in one region. So where inodes are and where data are, they have to be shifted or changed in some ways so that the bitmap for the new data block could be next to. Hmm. Um, yeah, so we do need to change the, the bitmaps. Uh, in this case, this is all the, the space we have. Oh. So we have eight slots for inodes, eight slots for data. So appending a, a new block, we're going to use one of our like non-allocated data blocks. Oh. But yeah, we need we need to, to update our, our bitmaps. What else will need to change? Ron? Also, the inode, you have to change, you have to add another data block in its pointer. So either you have to, depending on where we are, how many of the has you either have to add that to the direct spots, or like go to the indirect one, go to that data block, and add it there. Yeah, we need to, we need to update the inode to make this concrete. Maybe we have a simple inode that tracks owner. Permissions, size, and then just has four direct pointers with only eight data blocks like indirect pointers not really needed. So pointer one, pointer two, pointer three, pointer four. And so our initial state, I own this file, it has read write permission, it consists of one block, and that is block. Four. And these are these pointers are null. And so if we need to append a new block to our uh, 
to our inode, what, what parts of this inode would we need to update? I mean, this is all in, in one block. Uh, oh yeah. we, we just need to add a pointer and then increment the size. Yeah, so our size to become two, and we'll add uh, a pointer to a new data block. So, so we're changing, changing our inode. Uh, anything needs need to change over in our data? Uh, we need to allocate another block to fill one of those things with the orange. Which one should I fill with orange? The next one. N next one. Can you give me a number? Five. Yeah, we want to make our data uh, sequential if we can. That's going to be more efficient. Uh, so yeah, we'll stick. Uh, we'll allocate a new data block, and that gives us kind of the value that our, our pointer should have. Our second block of this file is now data block five. Eight. Sorry, why do we only have four pointers? Um, in this simple example, I've said the max file size is four blocks. Gotcha. Um, or maybe one of these could be indirect, and then you could have more. But just imagine we've said max file size is four blocks. We're not going to let any file take up more than more than half of our tiny disk. All right, and what would need to change about our our bitmaps? Yeah, we need to mark another another uh, slot as as allocated. And our bitmap. Corresponding with the new data to be allocated. So, how many separate writes, kind of separate locations, do we need to write to to make this one, one change to the file? Yeah, three separate locations. We need to update the bitmap, update the inode, update, um, uh, update our, our data block, and our device guarantees that updating a single sector or block of data on the disk, that's going to be atomic. So unfortunately, that means these three separate updates, the device itself does not make them atomic. So this means that, let's say we, uh, uh, we could do these three writes in any order. And now I want to think about the different scenarios that we may have to consider for how could this go wrong. So we have these three rights. We might do them in any order. And so I'd again like you to work with uh, your neighbors on there are going to be six scenarios, six different kind of partial uh, part of the way through this uh, update where we could crash. Again, because we might be doing these three in any order. Uh, so figure out what those six different scenarios are, like what has been changed and what hasn't at the point where the crash occurs. For example, you can you might one might be we're going to write data, write inode, write the bitmap, and the crash could occur here, or could, or could could occur here. That gives us kind of two of these six different scenarios. Um, so think about those are and. More importantly, think about what could go wrong as a result of a crash with that particular inconsistent state. Oh, All right, yeah. let's talk about some crash scenarios. Uh, let's think in terms of what, let's, let's label these scenarios in terms of what actually got written to disk before the crash. Uh, so what's one scenario for Part of this that could be could be written to this. Only the bitmap. All right. Only our bitmap got written to disk. Uh, what is there? Is that a problem? What could be wrong with that? Uh, now we presumably have a chunk of memory that's just inaccessible and gone forever. Yeah, we have a. 
space leak. We have some space that is just going to be permanently allocated because we marked it as allocated and there's nothing that's ever going to say it's free. Bigger. I think also if we only write to the bitmap, uh, we might see that uh, space in memory as allocated. So we could try potentially accessing data there. And we would like, who knows what data would be there. So that's like the worst scenario. Yeah, I. the only way that we get, like that is a concern. We don't want to just like read arbitrary memory. Uh, but in this case, the only way that we end up reading a data block is if we get there via an inode. Oh, like see. the inodes are the things that have pointers to data blocks. Uh, so if we only update the bitmap, there's just nothing that ever refers, that would ever send us to read that data. Okay. Carol? If we were only to write the data, then uh, it, we wouldn't really have any problems because we would just uh, reallocate or write over it later. Yeah, this only data is, in some ways, the nicest kind of crash. You know, we lose whatever the update was. But also, the user's computer just turned off in the middle of what they were doing. So it's like not super surprising that the data didn't make it. Uh, and we're not in kind of either of our bad or worse scenarios. So this is actually the OK-ish. Uh, oh, wait. Uh, look, so if only the bitmap got written, and then but, but the disk is permanent. So no matter how many times we restarted, the space is just like gone. From the uh, yes, the, it's marked in the bitmap as allocated. It's not part of any file, and so there's no process by which it would ever be deallocated, marked as free. So yes, it will just be it will be a leak. We'll have some uh, a block on the disk that is just until we just like clear the disk entirely. It's just going to be marked as allocated. So this is just getting smaller and smaller as you use it. <laughs> if this kind of thing happens. Uh, yes, so if this kind of uh, accrues, we're going to have more and more blocks lost. Um, anyone think of something, some way of determining, like, are there blocks out there that uh, we could reclaim somehow? Will? Keep some, like, limited, like, log of the last blocks we're into. Um, so that, like, if you recover from a crash, you can just check, like, in the last block the operation you want to progress in to see if it looks irrational. Um, yeah, keeping keeping some record of, of recent of recent things. On you just like loop through all the inodes and check all the allocated blocks that it's referenced to. There's a block that's not referenced to an inode, so it's not marked as allocated. You must have the loop to this. Yeah. So kind of Will's Will solution is let's keep some data in to help us recover from a crash, and if there have been recent errors. Uh, but we can also check, like, are the inodes and the bitmaps consistent? And through, like, just looking at every single block, we will determine which ones are bad in the bitmap, assuming that we're trusting the inodes, which, given that the inodes are how we get to read the data blocks, we kind of have to trust those. If we have a data block that's not an imap or an inode, we have no way of knowing which file it should be part of, we just have to get rid of it. Does that make sense? All right, other scenarios, thoughts, Vicente? Um, bitmaps and inodes get written, but not the data. We write our bitmap, we write our inode, but no data. Is this OK? Are we sad? Why are, why are we sad? Carol? Okay. Uh, reading junk or reading. Yes, this is our garbage scenario. We have a data block that looks like it's part of a file. We're going to read it if we read the file, but it's not containing any of the data that should be there. So yeah, we're going we're gonna to read nonsense. Uh, do you want to do an inodes? Do you have an issue where um, you like overwrite data that you're using and that happens randomly, like, just like a month later to overwrite your data? Yeah, we have the issue of the, if we haven't marked some block as allocated in the bitmap, but it is part of some file and the data is there, then sometime later that block may be allocated to a second file. And so now we have two, two, two files that are using the same block, 
uh, and overwriting each other or reading the other file's data. Um, yeah, and, then, and that's our that's our worst scenario. That's our like mystery files have mystery data, and there's no way to tell when you read the file that you're getting mystery data. Yeah, so that would be very bad. So we have have four scenarios. What are our other two? Uh, data and bitmap. We have our data and bitmap, and sixth, and only items. Yeah, only inode for our data and bitmap. Is that like one of these other scenarios? Yeah, it's it's. A, it's a block that's not part of any file that we can't reclaim unless we have some extra technique for doing that. So five is kind of we did we wrote data, but we still have this. This basically how about six? Huh? You can do like a mix of three and four because there is also this garbage in it, but also it can be allocated. So it's like the worst of all. Yes, six is our our ultimate sadness. It's both kind of the three and four together. Like we just updated the inode and then crashed. All right, so we have this, this um, cavalcade of, of tragedy, all these different ways in which our, our file system could, could uh, uh, end up in an inconsistent state. So I want to talk about two ways uh, kind of two two approaches to, to solving this um, this problem. One is going to be sort of the old school approach, uh, and one is going to be kind of what most modern file systems do. So first, the old system, uh, old school approach. Uh, and this is some sort of tool program that can check the file system. We were already kind of talking about this. Like, how would we know if there is these kind of, or if these space leaks? Well, we could just check all the blocks, check what the INS are using, what the bitmap stays allocated, all this sort of thing. There is a, uh, a tool on Unix, FS check, FSCK. Um, which apparently uh, some people who are not fans of this tool pronounce FSUC. Um, but it says when the system reboots after a crash, before the file system is mounted. So this just means before the file system is like connected to any other part of the system. Um, so this just ensures that no other file system operations could be running before this is this is mounted, um, and we're just going to we're just going to check every part of the system. We're just going to go through the bitmaps. We're going to go through our inodes, record, look at, okay, are the, the things that they're using, are they allocated the bitmaps, um, and uh, where possible, like, we're going to repair to restore things to a consistent state. So in the case of the space leak, we mark that as free in the bitmap. Um, if we're in a situation where uh, like we have, um, uh, and, and kind of the different, like there are things that we can't repair very well. Like we can put things back in a like not bad or, or worse state, but um, uh, the, the reading for today kind of goes through all the different sorts of things that we might repair and, and what this, this, might, uh, this tool might do. Um, anyone see it? downside to uh, ensuring our, our file system's reliability by having our file system checked as well. It's very inefficient. Yeah, it's super slow. 
checking every part of the disk. Disk can be really big. Our crash recovery can take hours if, we're, if we need to check every part of a large disk. Um, so uh, that's why this is kind of the old school approach. Um, it's, it's, it, there's really high overhead to using this strategy. Um, doesn't mean that it's never used. Uh, and uh, depending on the circumstances, this could be deployed as sort of an emergency fix. Like I, I need the disk to stop crashing. And like the way to do that is to like run a thing that's going to get rid of all the inconsistencies, so maybe some data will be lost, but or at least stop stop crashing due to some weird disk state. Does that make sense? Questions on our yeah. Can you ask a tangential question? Sure. I was reading online last week that someone tested a bunch of popular SSDs and found that like a lot of them don't actually like respect the flush instruction hmm. in the way they're supposed to and like randomly end up sure they just don't like write the data when they say they do. And I was wondering, like, on power loss, and I was wondering, like, how would that, like, affect it? If, like, the file system might, like, think that something had been written, but, like, it is not. Yeah, so my understanding is that if you tell a device to write some kind of multi block set of things, then all the device is guaranteeing you is that each individual block will be written atomically. It's uh, and it doesn't have to respect the order in which you said the blocks should be written, or it can uh, merge the writes, it can delay them. Uh, it basically can do its own scheduling of sort of multi-block writes. Um, so this is going to be a concern for the next strategy we'll talk about. Um, that we actually, if we want something to be persistent on disk, we basically have to issue these writes a single block at a time. Um, in order to uh, avoid the device itself messing with our assumptions about what's going to be on disk in order to, to do its own sort of performance optimization. Other questions? All right, so out with, uh, out with FSEC uh, and in with the new. But before we get to that, um, I'm sure you know uh, what comes next. We have good old Calvin Coolidge. Um, became president after uh, Warren Harding died of a, of a heart attack. Coolidge was the vice president. Uh, this is toward the end of, of Harding's term, and Coolidge ran for re-election, uh, was successful. Um, and this was uh, during the uh, kind of so-called Roaring Twenties. Um, there was lots of, uh, of new consumer goods, lots of speculation in the stock market, and uh, in particular, um, uh, the, there were places in, in, in Europe that were uh, still doing quite Badly following uh, World War One, uh, Weimar Germany in particular, but things were were, were not bad in, in the U.S. Um, Coolidge uh, was a, a famously taciturn president. Uh, there's a story that a, a woman once came up to him and said, "Like, I bet that I could make you say more than two words," and his reply was, "You lose." Um, he also had some uh, some some personal tragedy in in office. His uh, his son, I think, was was playing on a tennis court and fell and got some kind of scrape, and this thing got infected and his son died. And uh, there's uh, a speculation that he suffered from depression uh, in office. He was just very reluctant to do anything. This is both like his political philosophy and also just personally. He didn't think the president should do very much. Um, and uh, another story is uh, he he would uh, spend some of his time just sort of sitting 
uh, with his feet in one of the desk drawers in the Oval Office, just like watching traffic go by on the street outside. Uh, he had a weird sense of humor. He enjoyed like bring, like pulling a bunch of the cords, like bring in aides or, or servants to the old office, and then he would hide behind the curtains and watch people sort of just like be confused. So like, what? What's? Why? Why was I called in here? Um, and so, so kind of this was a um, that I mentioned for for Harding time of kind of blase fair economics, government not not intervening much uh, in the country's affairs. Um, there was an interesting exception in that Coolidge had had an unusually active Secretary of Commerce. Um, uh, and this uh, individual had an unusual amount of influence for uh, uh, the head of the, the Commerce Department and pursued lots of kind of different reforms and experiments. Uh, and this was uh, the, the, a well-known kind of national engineer by the name of Herbert Hoover uh, was uh, Secretary of Commerce during this time and kind of had a lot of prominence in the administration. Uh, and we'll, we'll hear how that goes next time. All right. So what are we hoping for in our... Um, and our kind of solution number two, which I'll give you the name of, uh, we're going to use a strategy called right ahead logging. Uh, this is the more common name. It's the name that is used in database systems, uh, in operating systems for historical reasons. Uh, this is sometimes called journaling. Uh, if you look at uh, the code for OSV, that's the term that's used in OSV uh, to, to, when it, as it implements a version of this approach. Um, so what we're, what we're hoping for is that when we um, uh, when we recover from a crash, uh, our file system consistency is maintained. We don't have our like free block uh, uh, that's actually um, part of a file or, or vice versa. Uh, it's, okay, it's going to be okay if we lose the most recent file system operations, but we shouldn't lose any um, uh, uh, anything before that. So kind of data I wrote yesterday should still be on the disk uh, when we recover. Uh, and, we would, and we also expect that operations kind of appear to have happened in the order that they actually happened. Uh, that we don't end up sort of seeing, um, seeing operations, operations reversed. Uh, and so we have A general trade-off to keep in mind between safety and speed, where if we want to kind of be as safe as possible, any time we're asked the question like, should we, can we, if we can write something to disk, we should do it as soon as possible, so that we always sort of. See, see things uh, on disk, lose as little as possible, but because disks are slow, if we're going to, um, uh, if we're going for, for better performance, you might kind of batch multiple writes into um, uh, a single disk write. Um, You might treat memory as a write back cache, meaning that we only write out things that were changed, things about files that were changed in memory when that memory is, is evicted and freed up for, for someone else to use. Um, I mentioned this write ahead logging is, uh, is a term that is used in, in database systems, really any storage system, file system, database systems. Um, have to solve this problem of reliability. 
of if we need changes to be persistent on disk, how do we actually accomplish that? Okay, so let's talk about what the basic idea is. So going back to our scenario here, we have our three, uh, our three writes. Um, and let's say that we Uh, we're going to write to block five the data. Uh, we're going to, uh, I will um, uh, I will say we're going to kind of write to, uh, write to block five. Uh, we're going to write to inode. and then write our bitmap. And uh, we want these set of writes to be, um, to, to kind of all happen or none of them happen. There's all of our crash scenarios where we had a part of the writes on the disk but not, uh, but not others. So We're going to build this strategy around the idea of a transaction. Uh, we're going to say a transaction is an atomic operation insofar as either all of it shows up on disk or none of it does. Uh, but it's going to encompass some kind of multi-step update to the disk. Um, and so we're going to add to our picture uh, no more green chalk, so we're going to add the add to some part of our system. I'm drawing it at the end, but there just would be space reserved for it somewhere on disk. We're going to re reserve some space for a log. And Here's how we're going to use use our log. So we're going to record all writes to the log uh, as the as the first step. So um, in our log here, we would see. Like our write to the data, we put that into the log. Uh, we put write uh, the inode into the log, and we put write uh, the bitmap into the log. So, kind of each of the updates that we're doing, first thing we're putting them into this log, which is just a sort of sequence of. Here is, here's the change that should be made to this block. Here's the change that should be made to this block. Um, and then once we have recorded all of the kind of multi-step uh, uh, parts of this transaction into the log, then we enter done into the log, kind of mark the end of the transaction. So record all writes to log, we're going to record uh, done. Recording done is called, is the commit step of our, of our write ahead logging. So we're going to put in all the, all the things into our log and then we commit and that just means we're going to mark the log as like this transaction is, is done. All parts of it are in the log. Then and we're going to take each of those updates in our log and actually write them to the disk. 
So this third step, we're saying, okay, we're now going to take this update that's in the log to the data and actually put it in the appropriate block and then take the update to the inode, put it to the inode, and so on. This also gets, this step gets a name, install. So we kind of begin the transaction, put all the updates in the log, commit them, marking the transaction is done, and then actually install the updates uh, into the file system itself. On crash, I guess the last step If we have a crash, um, we look at the log, and how would we know if there was, um, actually, yes, I need to mention that uh, once we've done this install, we clean the log uh, so that uh, and you can, uh, uh, one way, so cleaning the log is just we're kind of removing this stuff from the log um, uh, so that we can reuse that space in the log. Um, one way to think about it is instead of done, we write uh, the number of kind of uh, updates in the log. So we'd write three here. We have say, okay, this is done, and there are three updates. And then to clean the log, we change that to zero. Say, okay, there's no, the, the, uh, there's no updates before this point um, that need, uh, that haven't been moved to the disk. So then, on crash, how would we know if there are, uh, uh, if there are things that might not have made it to disk? Right, we, we're, there was a crash, the system might be inconsistent, uh, and we want to recover from it uh, by making thing, making sure everything that should be on disk is actually there. So, we rerun everything in log, then it'll be good. Yes, we just look, is there any done in the log? And this is important, because if we just have these first two things in the log and no done, is it safe to replay them? No, because then we might just do part of this transaction, but not all of it. So it's uh, on crash. We'll look at the log. If there, if we see it done, then we're going to redo those updates from that transaction. So. This gets the name redo the logging. Uh, and yes, maybe some of them happened, maybe some didn't. We don't know. But if we just replay all, if we just redo all of them, then what's on disk will be will be consistent. Questions? Looks oh. like double the overhead for every single disk point. It's not for every disk point. You got two two disk points. So that seems like really excessive. Yes, we have an overhead problem. Uh, we'll we'll tackle that in a moment. But yes, we, we now have we're we're now writing all our data to this twice. That's not great. It's okay. It's what happens if on a crash you check the log and you only have uh, write data and write I know. What does that signal at that point? It that it didn't finish mapping yes. that and, and would you just ignore it then and lose that data? Or? Yeah. So that's a great question. So if we just see kind of these two writes, no transaction done. What we know happened, or, or what we can infer happened, is that uh, we were in the middle of a transaction. We put some of the steps of that transaction in the log, but we never finished that transaction, which means that we never moved those changes over to the actual file system. And because we don't see the end of this transaction, we can't. We don't want to perform part of it, and we have no record of what the end of it would have been. So yes, we lose this in-progress transaction. Um, which uh, 
is what we want. It avoids the case where we have where we might be reading or writing correct things uh, on the disk. Uh, and yet, we would just throw that away. That's Isn't there some danger to running things twice as well? Like if we crash between the install and the clean log, and so we rerun everything a second time. If we got some counter that's just going up and is you know the counter of doom or whatever, and it's really important that it's accurate. Well, if we just rewrite that, if, if we have something called an increment dent. Yeah, so uh, that, that's a good point. These writes are always write this specific value gotcha. to this disk block. Um, that's, yes, it's very important. These are not arbitrary instructions. These are write this specific data to this block, uh, which, I mean, the, the fancy term for this is item potent, but it just like, it means that we could replay this log any number of times and the results on disk would be the same. It, kind of, it just says write this data to, to this location. Other questions? So is there like a situation where like a write to a disk somehow crashed the system because something's messed up and when this caused and like internal crashing is kind of where like you log on and you do the right, it crashes, you do crash you do the right again. Like, 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 like. Um yes. If our say our disk is just fried and, yeah. and we can't write to it at all, um, there's no recovery algorithm that can like resurrect no, our, our disk. Is fine. There's, like, like one specific segment is fine. Um, yeah, so I, I guess that would be uh, like maybe you would want some feature where you say reboot but don't try and fix the disk. And you go into some like safe mode where you can try and take some corrective action. Um, but we, it seems like the, the default should be at least that we, that we try and recover. Um, but yeah, maybe we, we probably need some sort of escape valve to be able to, to get out of some bad situation like that. Well, I'm wondering about like beyond the like right overhead and like the whatever the um, the implications of that are like disk lifetime and everything. I'm wondering about like if there are any optimizations for like spinning disks in this case. I'm imagining if like it has to move the head to wherever the log is and back to wherever the data is like every time. Like. Um. Yeah, we haven't gotten in, into much of this, but there are a lot of issues that you might need to consider more carefully when you're dealing with a, a, a spinning disk, um, because kind of repositioning to a different part of the disk uh, is is very expensive. Um, so I think we can say, compared to the file system checker, this write ahead logging is still going to be better performance-wise, um, because the file system checker would involve all sorts of like jumping around to, to verify things. Um, but yeah, I think it would be like if we, um, yeah, I mean, maybe we need to um, like read the log contiguously into memory and then move from, from there to then the spots that we're repairing um, rather than continually reading the log piece by piece off of disk. Um, but yeah, there's, I, I, I'm sure people have uh, worked on kind of optimizations for this exact case, because that, that could, seems like it could be a problem. Other questions? All right, so let's talk about uh, a couple challenges that we run into uh, in this um, uh, in this write ahead logging scheme, and we'll we'll deal with the, the one that um, I think Owen brought up first, which is each block is getting written to disk twice, once into the log and then once when we install it. Um, so that's more overhead than than we would like. Uh, so this uh, this approach, where we're recording all writes to the log, uh, the reading refers to this as I think data journaling slash logging, where we're logging all the data that, that's changing, um, but one. Um, optimization is what if we could log just 
just the metadata of the file. Um, and metadata here means, in this picture, like our Well, the, the things that we'll put in the log are changes to, say, the bitmap and the inode. Uh, but we'll we'll write the data just directly to the disk. So the data is going to bypass the log. So that kind of we're thinking that the vast majority of our writes will be file data rather than like. The, the inode and, and the data, uh, <clears throat> one inode per file, or files may have many blocks. Um, so if most of our writes are data, we bypass the log when we're writing data blocks, put them directly to the disk, uh, and just log, just use our write ahead logging for the metadata. Um, this brings up the issue of, well, which order do we, like, how do we arrange these? When do we write the data versus when do we log the metadata? Um, so I think this is a, uh, another thing you, I'm going to ask you to think about with your, your neighbors. Like, would it matter the order in which we did writing the data directly to the disk and logging the metadata? And if it does matter, is there a correct order to do it? In? Person's writing data on the other blocks. Yeah. All right. Does it matter what order we do these in? Uh, why? Uh, we said that data would probably be the best to do first because uh, it can easily be overwritten and it, it won't cause any of the worst or worst cases that would happen. Exactly. We saw before that if we just wrote the data and then crashed, it was relatively okay. Uh, whereas if we wrote metadata to the disk, but not the data, then we were in, we could be like reading reading garbage from a block that was was never written. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, like this is a significant optimization. Uh, in the case where we're not writing huge numbers of tiny files, right, where the number of data blocks that we're writing is significantly larger than the number of metadata blocks, then this will, will save us quite a bit of overhead um, as far as our logging is concerned. Questions on this? All right, the other challenge that I want to, to talk about um, for our, our write ahead logging is um, Something that we're going to want to do as much as we can is if we're working with a disk block, we're going to cache it in memory um, and then at some point later actually write that block out to disk. 
and it's much faster to work with a block that's in memory rather than continually uh, doing disk reads or writes. Um, however, what if our the uh, what if the cache, this is going to be just some part of the kernel that is managing this, uh, what if this block cache is full? What do, what do we do with the cache when it fills up and we need to, to cache something new? Well, you need block until we can have time to write some stuff. In. So, uh, we yeah we may need to, to wait until there's there's space in the cache. How would we uh, ensure that we get some space in the cache? By like doing the pending writes and like prioritizing that above whatever other operation is about to happen. Um. So I'm, I'm trying to get how does doing pending writes free up space in our cache? Well, we write to disk and the markup is free. Yeah, we need to kick something out of the, the cache. We need to evict it, and if it has been changed, yeah, we need to make sure to, to write that to this. So if, if the block cache is full, we need to evict a block from the cache and then write out its content. Well, other way around. We need to, to write out the contents to disk, and then we can kick it out of the cache. Um, so let's imagine in, in this scenario uh, we uh, we have uh, one of our like we're working with uh, with updating our our file and we're uh, we have these these blocks from our, our log um, uh, or we, we have we have blocks in in the cache and would it be okay? To like say, say we 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 need some new space in our in our block cache. Uh, the the block that we're changing, data block five, that's in the cache. Uh, would it be okay to evict that and write it out to the disk? Why not? You only need to evict something if the done for that thing is like zero. Yeah, exactly. That we we cannot write just write a block out to disk uh, separate from our, our write ahead log. It needs to be part of the transaction. It needs to be in the log so that we can um, recover appropriately. That if we just kind of write something out and then we have a crash, now we've made a change on the disk that's not in the log, and and life could be bad. So if we um, Need to to uh, evict something. We have uh, we need to we need to do what's called pin the blocks from the current transaction. In the cache, basically make it so that there's a rocket taking off. Make it so that uh, uh, blocks that we're currently using in the transaction cannot be evicted from the cache, um, uh, and so we won't have this problem. We write out part of our transaction sort of out of uh, out of phase with how the kind of transaction is supposed to be ordered. Does that make sense? I'm seeing confused faces. Yes. Are these transactions? Is it will they only work with one uh, with one uh, block, or can they be multiple blocks all bundled together? Um, our our transaction here is working with kind of three different blocks. Could you end up in a scenario, and this is absurd, but like. Could you end up in a scenario where you're using all of the different blocks and you can't evict anything because they're all in the log? 
Yes, and we could end up in that scenario in multiple different ways. Um, so one is, what if we have a really long transaction? And it just fills up the, like, one, this log has finite space. Also, our, our cache has finite space. Uh, and these actually impose a limit on the maximum transaction length. So one possible strategy is that uh, internally, the file system breaks this up into separate transactions. Um, and it would need to do that carefully so that um, it doesn't put the system in, a, in an inconsistent state, but it is just, if, but it's also the case that the file system might not be able to provide the same guarantees if you're writing to a really huge file that it does in most cases. That this we oh, we're constrained by the, the space in the log uh, and the space in the cache. Um, it gets worse if we can if we have concurrent file system operations, because then they're all using space in the cache. All the concurrent transactions are putting stuff into the log. Um, and there we probably need to just have a limit on the number of concurrent file system transactions that we allow to proceed at any one time. Um, so that we don't have uh, the log filled up with 50% uh, of 10 different transactions and now we're just sort of stuck. Um, and so the, a particular system needs to kind of take these messy details and edge cases into account. How big do you make the cache? How big do you make the log? What sort of limits do you impose on transaction length? Number of concurrent transactions uh, to make sure that this can actually work. Other questions? All right, and that's all I have for you today. Uh, I have office hours this afternoon at 4.30. Uh, remember the, the final project proposal uh, submit on Gradescope by uh, tomorrow at 9 p.m. And I'll see you Wednesday. Nobody knows just how it started.